Well, good morning, and thanks for joining me again for a Bible study this week. And we are going to be in the book of Romans for the last time. I'm, I'm excited to finish out the book and start something new next week. But today we're, we're going to be in Romans chapter 15. And I want to ask you a question, though, before we get started. I want you to think about somebody you may know. You might be them, but I'm sure you know someone like this. They always say, I don't need anybody's help. I can do this all by myself. I'm not going to call somebody to help me. I can, I, I'm good. I'm fine. I can handle it. You know, they don't need to cooperate with somebody else to get the task done. Well, today in chapter 15 of the book of Romans, we're going to see that cooperation is needed if we're going to reach the world with the gospel. Paul's going to spend this chapter looking back at his ministry and then looking forward to where his ministry is going to be going. Uh, before we do that, though, uh, before we read any, I want to ask you a question. I want you to pause and discuss this. I want you to think of what are the characteristics of a healthy Christian and a healthy church member. So take a moment to discuss that before we get started. So you might have come up with a few possibilities, and there are many possible answers for that question. But today we're going to read uh, the chapter 15, verses 14 through 16, and Paul's going to list a couple of examples of characteristics for a healthy church member and a healthy Christian. I want you to see if you can pick up on those as we get started, all right? I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one, one another. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul begins this section with an exhortation to the Roman church. He says, you're a good church. He says, you are morally healthy. You're filled with goodness. He says, you're intellectually healthy. You're filled with all knowledge. He says, you as a church are functionally healthy. You, uh, you're able to instruct and you're able to be instructed. Now, I know I've gotten up in your face a lot in this letter, Rome. I know I've challenged you on some things. I've, I've called you out on some things. I've, I've, I've said that we need to do this right and that right. And he says, but I do it because what I do is so important because God's called me to be a minister to the Gentiles. And I take my calling to be super important. You know, I think it's almost as important, Paul says, as, as what the priest might feel uh, in the temple in Jerusalem. You see, they, they're they called to offer sacrifice, to prepare a sacrifice and present that to the Lord so that the Lord will be happy. He says, I feel the same way. I feel that my ministry is a sacrifice. I feel that actually what I'm doing is I'm preparing a sacrifice for the Lord. Now, in Jerusalem, they are taking an animal and they're slaughtering it. They're preparing it and sacrificing that to the Lord to make him happy in their, in their thought. And Paul says, I don't, I don't kill an animal, but I make converts and I present you Gentiles as a sacrifice to the Lord. I present you to the Lord and say, say, God, these people, they've been set apart. They've been sanctified by the Holy Spirit and they are set apart for you. Now, Paul goes on to talk to them more and more in the letter about why his gospel ministry is important. He says, I call you out because, first off, I know you're spiritually healthy enough to take it. You know, sometimes in life, people, they, they're not ready to hear what we have to say to them sometimes. Uh, but Paul says, Rome, you're ready. You can take what I, what I have to tell you. He says, and what I have to do is really important because I do it for the Lord. Discipleship and evangelism is a cooperative effort. Someone is doing the telling and someone is hearing. Someone is guiding and someone is being guided. They work together to grow in the faith. Uh, one commentator said this about the church at Rome, none were so wise that they had nothing more to learn, and none were so inept that they had nothing of value to share. I want you to take a moment and think about those three areas of, of healthiness that we talked about, uh, morally, uh, intellectually, and functionally. I want you to think about those areas in, in terms of your personal life. Where might you be able to grow uh, in those three years? Where might you be able to grow in goodness, grow in knowing all things, or filled with all things, all knowledge? Where might you grow in, uh, in being a good church member, being
being led and leading others, serving and being served by others. So take a moment and think about that, maybe discuss that with the folks you're watching with today. Now, Paul has explained why his ministry is so important to him. And, and we've seen that ministry is cooperative. It is those who are guiding and those who are being guided, those who are serving and those who are being served. And as we read in verses 17 through 19, I want you to listen for what things made Paul's ministry possible, made his ministry successful. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. By word and deed, by the powers of signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way to Elycrium, I have fulfilled the, God, the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Now, Paul begins this section by saying, I don't brag a lot, but when I do, I brag about God. And did you see the three things that he said made possible his ministry? First, he said word and deed. Paul had to go do the work. God called him to a ministry. Paul just couldn't sit back and expect someone else to do the work for him. He had to go do the work. He had to go say what needed to be said. Then he said signs and wonders. These are miracles that verify Paul's ministry and his successes that verify Paul's message. And then he says, lastly, power of the Holy Spirit. Um, all this work and all this success and all it's done is not done just by Paul. It's empowered by the Holy Spirit. The same thing applies to us today. If you're a missionary in Southeast Asia, if you're a children's Sunday school teacher in rural Louisiana, if you're a VBS worker who you just come and say, put me to work somewhere, if you are doing ministry by going out and visiting people in their homes or visiting people in the hospitals, we do the work. God calls us to do something, we do the work, and the Holy Spirit then empowers us to do that work. I want you to think back for a moment on a time where you were involved in a ministry and you saw um, some success. You saw God make a move. You saw God do something. And I want you to think on that and, and think about what you did, what you had to do to make that happen. How the Holy Spirit maybe helped you do that. Maybe you were scared to go to the hospital for that first hospital visit. Maybe you were scared to get on that plane to go to Southeast Asia. Maybe you uh, you got in a, in a situation at VBS and you had to share the gospel with a kid. You're thinking, I have no idea how to talk to kids about the gospel. And the Holy Spirit gave you the words. Think about what you did, how the Holy Spirit helped you do that. And I want you to spend some time either by yourself or with the people around you. And I want you to just brag on what the God, God did that situation. Think about what flew flowed out of that situation. If you're by yourself, I just want you to thank God for that. And I want you to just brag on him for just a moment. Well, we as a church and as a church community need to be reminded that discipleship and evangelism is a cooperative effort. We partner together and we partner with the Holy Spirit so that we can see what the Lord has to do. And we, then we can brag on him after the fact. You know, when we see success, we should be like, oh, humble. And no, oh, well, you know, and we should say, no, God did a great thing. That's what Paul did. Paul said, I saw almost all of the eastern Mediterranean coast, the, the civilization here has access to the gospel now because of me following through, God making it possible the Holy Spirit making it possible, and then God doing a great thing. We can brag on that. We can be excited about what God has done and what God is doing. But Paul says, when you see something like that happen, we don't just sit back on our laurels. That's not what he did. Look at verses 20 and 21. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Now, Paul says here that he doesn't want to build on someone else's foundation. Now, does that mean Paul is just wants to be a long ranger Christian missionary, go out there, do it all on his own, don't depend on anybody else, I've got this, we're good? No, that's not what he's talking about, because if you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you'll see there he, he uses an agricultural metaphor to talk about him and another minister and how, how Paul planted this other minister 
watered and then God made the increase. And so you see that Paul's not on his own. What he's talking about here is a reminder of his ministry. It's a reminder of what he's called to do. Paul says, I don't want to build on someone else's foundation because I want to go where there's not a foundation. I want to go where no one has taken the gospel yet. That's what God's called me to do. That's what my life mission is, to go to unreached people groups and share the gospel. Let someone else go and, and kind of be the, the discipler and the, the pastor who pats on people and does various people and does their funerals and you know, marries people. Let someone else do all that. I'm going to go to uncharted waters because that's what God's called me to do. You see, we're not all called to do that. We all have ministry uh, we all have ministry callings and we're all shaped differently by the Lord and we, we all have our different passions and we all have our different abilities. That, but regardless of what we do, we need to make sure that we're doing verse 21. Verse 21 says, Those who have been told of him will see and those who have never heard will understand. Paul's quoting here from Isaiah chapter 52. And his quote uh, has to do with the suffering servant, the Messiah who's to come. And it also has to do with the gospel. Paul says, I'm taking the gospel to a new people. And that should be what our, our, our goal is. Whether that new person is in Southeast Asia, whether that person is at the end of our road, whether that person is around out on the, the lake, whether that person has a cabin uh, down the road from you, whatever it is, wherever you are, it's our goal to take the gospel to a new people. So here's what I want you to think about for a second. How can you participate and fulfilling that prophecy made by Isaiah hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years ago. Um, how can you help take the gospel to a new people? How can you share the gospel with someone new this week? Take a moment and discuss that. So I hope you thought of a few ways that you can participate in missions and ministry around your community, or around the world, and how you can be a part of fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy about the gospel. Uh, but Paul goes on to say, we can't do this by ourselves. Here's my, reminds us again and again of that. And the next few verses, he's going to talk about uh, a task he has right now at hand. His task right now is to take an offering that he's been given by all these Gentile churches around the Mediterranean. They've collected money. And he's taken that money back to Jerusalem to give to the Christians there who are in need. He says those Christians in Jerusalem sent out a spiritual blessing to the Mediterranean Gentiles out there, those Gentiles now are turning around and sending back a financial blessing to those Christians in Jerusalem because they need it right now. And Paul says that we do this, we cooperate together to expand the gospel and to take care of one another. He's going to pick up verse in verse 30 though, and he's going to ask the church at Rome to help him out in a very special way. So look at verse 30 with me. He says, I appeal to you brothers by our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Holy Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I might be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem will be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's grace I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul says not only do we cooperate to reach and teach others through our empowered words and deeds. He says we also do so through prayer. And that's what he's asking the Romans to do. He's saying, Roman church, will you pray with me as I return to Jerusalem to deliver this offering? I want to take it there. And I, I'm, I'm praying specifically that I be delivered from the unbelieving Gentiles, the unbelieving Jews in, in Jerusalem so that I can come to you in Rome and then eventually go on to Spain uh, to share the gospel in a whole new place. Some of you who know Paul's story might be thinking, well, hold up. If they prayed that prayer, well, then obviously God either didn't answer it or he said no to it because the prayer was to be delivered from the unbelieving Jews in Judea. And if you know Paul's story, you know, he was captured in Judea, taken off in chains to, to Rome to be tried and eventually to be executed. So God didn't answer his prayer. Well, actually, if you go to Acts chapter 21 and Acts chapter 23, you see that God did answer his prayer. God used the Romans twice to protect uh, Paul from the unbelieving Jews in Jerusalem. And it's fascinating. Paul says in God's will, and he talks about Christ's will several times throughout this passage. And I want you to think about this fact. God's will and my will don't always look the same. My will 
and Christ's will don't always look the same. Christ has a calling on my life. He calls me to do something. He allows me the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. He brings the increase in those times that the Holy Spirit uh, empowers me, you. But sometimes our plans don't look like his plans. Sometimes we can plan and plan and plan, and God says, no, no, I'm going to do it this way. Paul, you, you want to get to Rome? Okay, you plan to sail there by yourself. You're, you're going to buy a ticket and sail there, God says. Mm. No, no, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to put you with some Romans who can protect you and get you to Rome on their dime, and then they can then uh, have you there in a house, a prison, whatever, and, uh, and you're going to be able to share the gospel uh, while you're in chains. And Paul's like, God's will. Uh, God has a plan for me. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for our church. And sometimes that plan does not look like what we want it to look like. Right now, the past eight weeks has it been, God had a plan for us that we did not see coming. And uh, God had a plan for us to study the book of Romans together in our small groups uh, together separately, but instead, uh, we had that plan. God had a plan for um, for me to teach it to a camera and put it out there for you to get. And uh, so, I encourage you as we begin, to, as we now have summed up the Book of Romans, uh, to think about how you're going to be part of God's ministry. God has a plan for for you and a plan for me to participate in His ministry. How are you going to How are you going to join up with someone else and cooperate and help fulfill that ministry? How are you going to uh, to be a part of something big that God has planned for you and for your church. How are you going to join in on that? I really want to want you to pray about how you're going to do that. And um, I look forward to next week joining you again as we move into the book of Proverbs. It's going to be a whole new type of survey, uh, uh, study. So I encourage you to join me back here next week. And until then, pray that the Lord lead you, guide you, and cause you to be His minister in your community.